Hello and welcome to this segment of Arts Talk. I'm Sherry Burr and my guest for this segment is the biographer James McGrath Morris, who's the author of this new book called Eye on the Struggle and it's about the life of Ethel Payne. Welcome, James. It's I'm good to have you. Today. So let's have you tell us how you came to write this particular biography. Well, I'd written several biographies of journalists, and I mm -hmm. was casting about for yet another journalist to write about. Unfortunately, writers, much like actors, are typecast, so mm -hmm. I'm not off to write the next romance novel. Okay. Anyway, when I came across Ethel Payne's name, I realized there was an enormously significant story to be told, mm -hmm. but I presumed somebody was at work on it. Mm -hmm. And I discovered as I began to dig around that in the major archives of the United States where her papers were kept, nobody had ever opened the boxes. Oh, wow. Contacted her family, no one had ever called them. Wow. So I realized the story was mine to tell. That's great. Okay, so who is Ethel Payne? Well, Ethel Payne is a significant reporter of the 20th century who made civil rights her beat. And part of the intersection that makes her life so interesting is that she worked for the Chicago Defender, which was the leading black newspaper of the time. Mm. And when people hear the name Chicago Defender, they immediately assume it's a Chicago newspaper. It mm. is, but it's not merely a Chicago newspaper, mm -hmm. no more than the New York Times is merely a New York paper. It mm -hmm. was a newspaper of immense national importance. So it was sold all over the country? Not only sold all over the country, it played a really important historical role in changing the composition of the United States. Mm -hmm. Before World War II, when that newspaper was circulated in the South, it was against the law in several counties to even get it. And segregationists oh. could invoke you know, severe violence on a black family who got the Chicago Defender. Wow. Why was that? Because Chicago Defender was reporting on the horrors in the mm -hmm. South. You know, the South is very fragmented, and the mass media hadn't arrived in that sense. So a family, a black family living in Alabama, didn't know what was going on in Mississippi except mm -hmm. by hearsay. So the Chicago Defender was reporting this, but it was also reporting the better life that was offered to African Americans in the North. While the cities of Chicago and Detroit and others were segregated, mm -hmm. the economic advantages of the North were immense. Mm -hmm. And it helped trigger the mass migration that's so wonderfully portrayed in Isabel Wilkinson's book, The Warmth of the Suns, which mm -hmm. so many people have read. Well, the Chicago Defender was one of the instigators of that. So it's not a minor newspaper that mm -hmm. she was working for, but because of segregation, just like so many other African American institutions at the time, it operated in complete invisibility from mm. white America. So it's not astonishing that most whites have never heard of the Chicago Defender or Ethel Payne, mm -hmm. and that's why to this day she's not well known. Wow, so you aim to change that. Well, I'd like to, yes. yes. I don't okay. know if I would be able to. And you brought us some pictures. So let's yep. just start with the very first picture that you have for us. Well, the first picture you're seeing is a picture taken about 1912. She was born in 1911 in mm -hmm. Chicago, in a part of the South Side Chicago. And the next picture I believe we're going to see Yes, that's a picture of her and her brother in front of the house. Mm -hmm. Now, what's significant about the house, there are two aspects that are significant about the house. One, the family owned them. That was very rare for African Americans in Chicago mm -hmm. to own a house. And the reason they owned them is that her father was a Pullman porter. It's one of mm -hmm. the two best jobs that were open to African Americans in Chicago at that time. Mm -hmm. Post office was the other. So they were able to afford their own house. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it was in a part of South Side Chicago that was different than other parts, mm -hmm. in that her f few blocks in that photograph that you see, she described as being on an island surrounded by a sea of whiteness. In oh. other words, her black neighborhood was surrounded by white neighborhoods, which permitted her to walk to better services, to better libraries, and to better schools, mm -hmm. and that fundamentally changed her life. Mm. Uh, there she is graduating from Lynn Bloom High School in 1930. Um, the school was, a, to say it's a majority white school is an understatement. It was 99.9 percent .9 white. She was one of a handful of black students. Segregation in Chicago is not a legal matter, it's a social matter. So mm -hmm. if you were in the school district and you were black, you were allowed to go to that school. Mm -hmm. And like many things that she experienced, they were more than glad to use her reporting in the school paper, but they never gave her a post on the paper. Oh. And justice can sometimes be but served. But they gave her a byline. They gave her a byline, and, but justice can be served. This year, the journalism room at Lynn Bloom High School has been renamed in her honor. Oh, that's wonderful. So many years later. That's wonderful. You're seeing a picture of her in Japan in 1948, mm -hmm. and she's with a number of African American troops. She's working in a service club um, hostess in Japan. And people would presume, if they know their history, that 1948 means the troops are desegregated because Truman had signed the desegregation order. But General MacArthur had no interest in obeying the commander-in-chief's orders, so the troops remained segregated in Japan. Mm -hmm. So she worked as a service club hostess for a black service club. Mm -hmm. What I found particularly interesting is that segregation worked one way. White troops loved coming to her club. The music was better. Ah, uh, 
Ah, that's interesting. Now she's returned to the United States and she's become a reporter for the Chicago Defender. Mm -hmm. The face on the right will really test people's historical memory. That's Adlai Stevenson, then governor of uh, Illinois, who ran twice for president in mm -hmm. the 1950s and failed to win. There she is with Senator Douglas, and you'll notice the hats. Mm -hmm. um, it was very fashionable for her to wear hats, and, and she did all her life. Wow, that's great. Oh, this, this photograph involves a, a great tale. That's Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. Vice President of the United States. In 1957, Ethel Payne, then as a correspondent for the Chicago Defender, traveled to Africa, to Ghana. Ghana was the first sub-Saharan country to become uh, free of colonial rule, so it was mm -hmm. a big deal. Eisenhower sent Nixon to represent the country. Ethel Payne went to write about it, and who else would show up would be Martin Luther King. The first meeting between Richard Nixon and Martin Luther King takes place in Ghana, 3,000 miles away wow. from uh, the country. And King famously invites Nixon. He says, well, if you really want to see the black freedom struggle, why don't you come south and visit us? And what did Nixon? And Nixon realized he was cornered, said, I can't do that, but why don't you come to Washington and have a meeting with me? So the first meeting that Martin Luther King had with the vice president occurred, occurred shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. Then it led to a meeting with Eisenhower, and those are the first meetings that the civil rights leader begins to have with American presidents, and Ethel Payne was there to cover it. But to finish the story of this photograph, in 1958, the reporters that had accompanied Nixon to Ghana suggested that they have a reunion at mm -hmm. her apartment. Huh. And Simeon Booker, who worked for Jet Magazine, said, well, why don't we invite the vice president? They all had a good laugh like he would come. Right. He chose to come. Really? So Pat Nixon, his wife, and he showed up at the apartment. This is one of the photographs from that meeting. And to give you a sense of the tenor of the times, mm -hmm. Jet Magazine ran a photograph from the event, and it says, in a first time, a vice president socializes at the home of a Negro in Washington. Wow. So that should take us back to the era in which she was working. Wow, that's amazing. So... And the book opens up with a photograph with her and um, as part of the press pool mm -hmm. covering Lyndon Johnson as he's signing a major historic... Well, actually, she's not a member of the press pool. Oh, you know, time? you're right. Okay. But the distinction is she's among, among the invited guests. Ah, and why that's better. so okay. significant is okay. in 1964 when Johnson was signing the Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. and later when he signs the Voting Rights in 65, there's an American tradition. Mm -hmm. Presidents sign their names with a multiple number of pens. Right. If you've ever watched Obama sign a right. bill, he starts with the O, puts the pen down, and keeps dotting and all that. Right. Because those pens are given as political rewards to people who made the legislation possible. Uh -huh. So in 1964 when the White House was trying to figure out who to invite to the East Room for this major signing of mm -hmm. an, a bill that's going to change lives for hundreds of thousands of Americans. Mm -hmm. Ethel Payne is among those who are chosen to be there as a recognition of her importance as a reporter, as a conduit of information from the front lines of the civil rights movement to readers. Wow. So she is among those and the photograph in the book is of Johnson handing her a pen. Oh, wonderful. Let's see if our audience has any questions for mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Morris. Uh, my question is, when you're covering someone's life uh, with a lot of accomplishments, you're going to go through a lot of material, mm -hmm. probably um, good and bad. Um, when do you know you're done with a book? Oh, wow. And how, may, how do you make that decision um, of not including some things and including some other things? Great question. It's a hard question to answer. Yeah. Um, the first thing is that I cut a lot from books that I'm really attached to if they don't serve the story. Mm -hmm. So I found an incredibly great story about Thurgood Marshall in Japan because he came to help her when she was in trouble. But it wasn't relevant to the story, so I cut it out. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is I cut mercilessly. Secondly, with attention spans these days, 400 pages is a lot for folks to read, so I'm always cutting in that eye. Mm -hmm. um, there also comes a certain economy of my kind of work. You know, Will I go to Michigan to open up one file folder that might lead to one paragraph that's not consequential? Mm. I may have to choose not to do that. It's really no different than being a reporter on long-form journalism. You have to decide what you can and can't include. Mm. Um, and secondly, the selection of items. At, in writing a biography, it's much like a portrait painting. You begin to see the image that develops, so you choose things that fit your version of that person, which may be different than somebody else. I mean, frankly, I'm an old white guy. A uh, young black woman or um, a young black male or an old black woman or somebody of a different background would bring a different kind of thing to that canvas. Mm -hmm. Mine is from my own cultural background. So 
as I saw, for instance, her first of her life, first half of her life until she's 40, represents nothing but doors being closed on her. Every job she wants to get, she can't get. In 1930s, when she's looking for a professional job in Chicago, seven out of 10 African-American women who held a job in Chicago held a job as a domestic servant. So the idea of her becoming a lawyer or a writer was just out of it. And one of the things that intrigued me is every no strengthened her. As opposed to giving up, she kind of turned no's into yeses. So as I would look at my material, anything that served to illustrate that is what I would include. Mm. But you also raised the question of, uh, of less flattering material. Mm. Everyone who's important, including ourselves, even if we're not important, we have our less good moments in lives. And if you know you're going to be famous, you do what most famous people do, is you immediately burn those letters or get rid of things. Ethel Payne knew she was well known, but not to the extent of sanitizing her life. And there are a number of things she did that were mistakes. Mm -hmm. She made a mistake as a journalist in her coverage in Vietnam. She made a mistake in Africa covering certain leaders who turned out to be despotic thugs later. Mm -hmm. um, she made some journalistic mistakes. She was untrained. Um, she didn't go to graduate school in journalism. And so what you hope to do is portray those contextually in a sense that, that um, I think you're sympathetic to her mistakes. I mean, the, she makes some bad reporting mistakes when she first gets to Washington. But keep in mind, as an African-American, as a national correspondent in Washington, she hadn't gone to Columbia. She made some journalistic mistakes. And I think they add to the quality of her reporting. She had this deep, instinctual sense of journalism that's different, that you couldn't train. Mm. And a, a radio show host that um, does a jazz show said to me while I was on book tour that he thought of her very much like a jazz artist, learning on the band rather than opposed to learning in school. And I think he was really right in nailing that. Okay. Good question. All right. Joaquin has a quick question. My question is about the title of the book, I on the Struggle. Um, you know, what made you choose that word or, or, or that, that title? Two things. The uh, course says keep your eye on the prize, which was a, a theme of the Civil Rights Movement. But I wanted my book to accomplish two things. I ended up accomplishing three. The first was I wanted to have a biography of a person who'd made civil rights their beat, who was a significant historical figure and that few people knew about. So I didn't want to call it Ethel Payne because people would say Ethel who. But secondly, I particularly wanted readers to see the civil rights struggle through her eyes, not through my eyes of a historian 60 years or 50 years later. And her reporting gives you a chance to do that. To give you an example, in 1955 when she lands in Montgomery, I mean this is the front lines of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. The white press hadn't even come down yet. Martin Luther King, if he appeared in a newspaper, mm -hmm. was known as M. Period L. King. King. She was the first to perceive this dramatic change that was taking place in the leadership of the civil rights movement from lawyers like Thurgood Marshall to men of the cloth. She wrote, this new gladiator goes into battle wearing a reverse collar and holds the Bible in his hand. Wow. And that was so perceptive and so interesting that I, that's what I wanted to give you. The third aspect of the book that ended up being mirroring the title but completely unintended is as I sought to explain to my audience, both African American and white readers, the historic role of the black press, I discovered that everybody has forgotten it. That just providing that background ends up being an important part of the book. That the black press was a dynamic, important actor in the 20th century, both in chronicling the civil rights movement and moving it forward. So. All the way around, Eye on the Struggle ended up being, in some ways, the best title I've ever had for a book. Perfect. And on that note, we're going to pause and take a break, and we'll be back in a few minutes with James McGrath. Nice. Thank you.